Sunday Cornerstone, would you stand on your feet as we praise the Lord together today? We believe that we serve a faithful God that is true to His promise. Amen. Let's celebrate that together. Come on. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Your way is the only way for me it's a narrow road that leads to life but i want to be on it it's a narrow road but the mercy is wide because you're good on your promise so come on we sing i'll take you at your word if you say I've seen it in my life It's a narrow road that leads to life But I want to be on it It's a narrow road, the tide is high But you wanted the water Yes. Mm-hmm. 
And we choose today, God, that we count it all joy and we endure trials because your strength is perfected in our weakness. I can't go back to the beginning. Can't control what tomorrow will bring. But I know here in the middle is the place where you promised to be. Come on, let's lift it up, church. Come on, we sing. I'm not enough unless you come. We meet me here again. All I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again?
Psalm chapter 139 in verse 7 through 10. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. As we've been singing today of this truth that we have a God who is faithful to his promise that he will never leave us, that he will never forsake us, that we could be in the midst of the highest highs in life or the depths of the lowest low, and he is there. Can I encourage you today, church, wherever you find yourself, if it's in the middle of a fire like we were singing about, if it's in the middle of a storm, if it's in the middle of doubt, fear, suffering, pain, questioning, insecurity, loss, grief, wherever you find yourself today, know that we have a God who promises to be faithful in his love towards us a love that was poured out upon the cross that still reaches us today in the depths of our sin. In the depths of our mistakes, the pain that we sometimes cause, that God is still with you. If there's something that I have to encourage you in today if you walk away with one thing from this time of worship it's he is with you he is with you nothing you can do nothing you have done can take you away from his love hands as we sing this together as a sign of surrender we say cause all I want is all you are will you meet me here again I'm not enough I'm not enough unless you we thank you that you are here God, that we know that you're with us wherever we go but there's something tangible when we worship together that we sense your presence in a completely different way God we know that your presence is here with us we're thankful that your strength is perfected in our weakness. And today, God, we confess that we are weak, that we are broken, and we are nothing apart from your presence. So Holy Spirit, would you bring those dead things to life that are within us? Dry bones awaken. God, we place our lives in your hands, whatever circumstances we're facing, the things represented in this room, those that may be worshiping online today. God, we place our lives in your hands. We say, have your way, have your will in us and through us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Speak to us by your word today. 
and we give you thanks because you are good and you are faithful. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Hey, church, is a sign of your faith, would you just lift up a shout of praise to say, hey, we believe that we serve a faithful and loving God. Amen. So good to be in church with you on this Sunday. Before you're seated, turn to a couple people around you, maybe introduce yourself, tell them happy Sunday, and then you may be seated. Stone. Welcome to church. Good morning, good morning. If we haven't met yet, my name is Wesley. I'm one of the pastors here. And I just want to say it's so good to worship with you this morning. Again, if you're joining us online, thank you for joining us. We pray that you're blessed today. Um, if this is your first time, maybe you're new-ish here to Cornerstone, uh, we want to give you a gift card to Starbucks. And, and to do that, go ahead and text the word NEW to the number on the screen, 951-425-4425. Uh, we want to say thank you for joining us. Thank you for making Cornerstone a part of your Sunday. Um, additionally, we have a new here team who would love to meet you. You can find them on the patio after service underneath the gazebo. They can answer any questions you might have and get you connected or plugged in uh, to a ministry here at Cornerstone. And today also marks um, the launch of our next groups session. Um, groups is one of the best things that we offer here at Cornerstone. Um, in my um, upbringing, my Christian experience thus far, small group ministry has been one of the most impactful ways um, that I've grown as a Christian. And so um, it's a great way to get connected with other individuals here at church. It's a great way to grow in your discipleship to Jesus in the context of community. Uh, two ways to get involved with groups. You can text the, no, the word groups to the number on the screen, um, or you can go talk in person out on the patio with Pastor Raul and the groups team. They'd love to get you plugged in um, to a group that fits your context. We have life groups, discipleship groups, interest groups, study groups, support groups. Really, there's a group for everyone here at church, and it would be great for you to get connected in that way. Uh, this Friday is our Young Family Camp Out. It's sponsored by our Young uh, Families Ministry, but it is open to everybody. It's gonna be this Friday and Saturday from 3 p.m. until 9 a.m. the next morning. Uh, really, really looking forward to this event. My daughters are, are already getting their stuff ready. We have our tents uh, and, and camping stuff um, in the garage kind of staged for this weekend. Uh, if you wanna join us, it's gonna be a really, really good time. Text the word camp also to the number on the screen uh, and join us. It's gonna be really, really fun. Um, and, and lastly, uh, just a special shout out to a program that we have here called Right Now Media. The church uh, subscribes to this discipleship-based tool that is free for everyone who attends Cornerstone. You can visit our website at go to cornerstone.com slash rightnowmedia to create a free account. You guys, there are hundreds of videos that you can use as a family, as an individual, as a couple to, again, grow in your discipleship to Jesus. There's programs for kids, for singles, again, married couples, really, again, anyone, and it's a great way to further develop in your faith in Christ. And so I highly recommend uh, creating a free account. Go to that website on, on, the, on the screen, um, and it'll be really, really good times. And actually, a lot of our groups here utilize the curriculum on Right Now Media. Uh, now we're going to continue our time in worshiping as we uh, respond to the Lord's goodness and kindness through a time of giving. I mean, as one, of, as one of your pastors here at Cornerstone, I just want to say thank you for your generosity. Uh, your generosity is, is how we're able to do all the things we do here at church, to bless so many people here in this valley. Um, and so uh, we just, just, just saying thank you for your generosity. Um, there's several ways to give here at Cornerstone. You can text any dollar amount to 84321. You can give online, through the app. If you're here in person, you can utilize the giving boxes located throughout campus. Uh, put your money inside the giving envelope located in your seat back in front of you. Um, and it'll be just, like, again, a good way to respond to God's kindness and goodness um, in our lives. Uh, join me as I pray. Lord, thank you for being a good God who, who gives us good gifts. Thank you for being a loving God, a kind God, who blesses us with resources, Lord. And, I, and as we now respond to your goodness, I pray that you would bless the giver, Lord. Bless them abundantly as they give as a sacrifice unto you, Lord. Give our leaders wisdom, our pastors wisdom, in the best way to utilize these gifts for ultimate gospel impact in our valley. 
And Lord, now as we turn to your word, we thank you that it's living, it's active, it's powerful, it's sharp, it's discerning, it moves us. I pray that your will would be done, Lord, as we dive into your word. Be with Pastor Andy. Strengthen him, Lord. May he speak with power and with clarity to us this morning in a way that helps us in our faith, in a way that glorifies Jesus. We love you so much, Lord. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Welcome again to Cornerstone. Last week, Pastor Ron Armstrong was in rare form and had us in stitches. Um, we got the laughing part of our new series down, right? The Art of Loving and Laughing. It's a series on marriage and singleness. And as we continue today, we're going to jump into this and, and see what the Lord wants to speak to us. Last week, Pastor Ron talked about kindness and conflict within marriage, and we want to deal with conflict, right? If, we, if we're always arguing and fighting, that's no place to be. There's actually a scripture, Proverbs 21.9. I can picture Solomon writing the scripture at a poker game, only surrounded by guys. He's smoking a cigar, and he's like, you know, guys, you know, how about this? Uh, it's better to dwell on the corner of a rooftop than in a house with a quarrelsome wife, right, right? And those guys were smart enough not to nod their heads, not to move, not to say anything, because it would get back to their wives. And so, listen, we don't want to be fighting and arguing, and Pastor Ron gave us a lot of good tools to deal with that last week. As we think about marriage, we have to think about how God made humans. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, speaks of this. It says, this is why a man shall leave his father and be united with his wife and become one flesh. God made us in his image and desires us to go from two to one when it comes to marriage. And how do we do that? I think there's a key that we're given in the New Testament. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, talking about who we are, our being, says this. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. God made us to have a body, a soul, and a spirit. It's one of the reasons we're made in his image is we have this about ourselves. And so because human beings are made like this, a married couple has to cultivate each of these aspects of intimacy if we are going to become one flesh. And so today we're gonna to talk about, about our body, our sexuality, our spirit, our spirituality, and our friendship, our soul, and how there's hope in marriage if we are connecting on all of these levels to become one flesh, to really be united. And so we wanna talk about loving our spouse first by focusing on our friendship with them, our soul. Jesus was the best friend of, of all people, and to his disciples, he said, you guys are my friends, and listen to the reason why he said it. John chapter 15, he says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. Jesus is saying, I'm not keeping secrets from you. What I know, I'm sharing with you. He he traveled and even lived with them for three years, and they got to know each other on such a deep level. And in a similar way, we can commune with our spouse by sharing our life's details, our fears, our concerns, our thoughts, our dreams. We want to share those with our spouse. Sometimes we get caught up and we're sharing those details with, with people at work and with other friends and we're you know, texting some friends. We've got to make sure we're telling our spouse about all the things that are going on in our life to cultivate our friendship. There's a few different ways that we can do that. The first is just to set aside time daily for sharing our life with our spouse. I know when I get home from work, it's, it's great that all the kids want to talk with me, but sometimes we find ourselves saying, mom and dad just need five minutes 
to talk to each other, and then we're gonna put the focus on you guys. And I just wanna make sure I'm updating Shannon about how my day went, how her day went, and, and how we can help each other. We wanna know how each other, how we communicate, our style of communicating, how we like to give and receive love. You've probably heard of this popular book, Five Love Languages, and it's helpful to show us how people like to give and receive love. I'll put it on the screen. The first is, is words of affirmation. Some people just wanna hear, job well done. I know when, when Shannon and I first got married and, and she was cooking me these amazing meals, I would say, oh, sweetie, this tastes so good. And then a few minutes later, she'd say, well, do you like it? I'm like, yeah, I just said it, it tastes so good. It tastes great. And she goes, oh, okay, good, I'm glad you like it. And then a few minutes later, we're not even done with the meal, she goes, so you like, I made the rice a special way, you like the rice? I'm like, yeah, I like, I like it all. I just said it tastes really, all of it tastes really good. And then the meal's done with, and, and, and later that evening, we're watching TV and there's a pause, and she goes, see, so you, you, you liked it? You're not just saying that you liked it? I'm like, yeah, I like it, I like all of it. I don't like how we're talking about this a thousand times, but I like, and then I realized, oh, she likes to receive love through words of affirmation. I don't, I don't need that, I don't, I don't like that, right? And so, but I can't just give her love the way that I like to, right? And so there's physical touch, there's gifts. That's how I like to give love. I like to, to give a gift to express my love. But I hate receiving love like this. Shannon's learned in our 15 years of marriage that if she gives me a shirt for a birthday or Christmas present or something, I'd better see somewhere on the tag, clearance rack, <laughs> I just hate, I don't mind spending money on my family, but I hate spending money on myself. I've got a limit. My ceiling for, for fashion is $18 for anything. Shoes, haircuts, shirts. This, this shirt costs exactly $18. So this is like the fanciest you'll ever see from me. It doesn't even fit me, but I couldn't afford the one that fit me. So it's a little wider than it should be. You can see it now, right? You can't unsee it now that I said it. It's, it's too wide, I know. But it was in my range, and that makes me happy, right? And so there's quality time. There's acts of service. If you're having a hard time understanding this, you don't have to read the whole book. You just got to think through some examples. Let's speak the universal language of tacos. Words of affirmation. The tacos you made are delicious. Physical touch. Let me hold you like a taco. <laughs> Gifts. Here's a taco. Quality time. Let's go out for tacos tonight. And acts of service. I made you tacos tonight. That... It's the ultimate expression of love. Know how your wife likes to communicate. The second way we can focus on our friendship is by being watchful of intimacy killers, right? There, there are some things that we do that take up all the time and don't allow us to connect and build our friendship. And I would say that too much screen time, too much TV and too much time on the phone can crowd out your friendship. And so prioritize your friendship before the, you know, the binging on Netflix and you just you know, go from that. Listen, it's great to do those things together, but make sure it's not crowding out your friendship. You should enjoy activities and hobbies together. People are constantly telling me, I think it's really unkind that you bullied your wife into liking the Olympic sport of curling. If you don't know what curling is, it's the one where if you didn't do your chores growing up, you have to permanently sweep the ice. And um, Thank you. Appreciate that, Kylie. Listen, everyone... Everyone else doesn't like this except for Shannon and I. We're alone in the church with this hobby. But I didn't force it upon her. We, we discovered this together. We've met the gold medalists. We really enjoy watching it and even going to games, matches, or events. I don't even know what you're supposed to call them because it's not really even a sport. But listen, we, we do this together, and it's something that we share. And thankfully, nobody else shares it, so I get to spend time with her. And establish a weekly date night or a daytime date. For us, we're saving that babysitter money when the kids are in school and I'm off work on Fridays. We have our date time during this time. But you've got to put it on the calendar or else everything else will crowd it out. Now, there's an interesting passage in the Old Testament that, that can give us some insight on how important this connection really is. And it's Deuteronomy 24.5. It says, if a man has recently married, he must not be sent to war or have any other duty laid on him. For one year, he is to be free to stay at home and bring happiness to the wife he has married. This is a cool rule. This is a cool guideline. In Israel, they would say the marriage union is so important that that first year of marriage, you should be focusing on, on your commitment, on your covenant, even at the expense of us having more people in battle. That's how important it is to God. 
And I've seen some people apply this by saying, hey, the first year we're married, we're not gonna watch any TV. We're just gonna get to know each other. We're gonna build that relationship. But maybe if you're in a season of resetting your marriage relationship, you wanna say, for the next year, we're gonna say no to things that separate us and say yes to that which draws us closer together. It would be an interesting way to apply that scripture. So you love your spouse by focusing on your friendship, but also by focusing on your sexuality. That's, your, that's the body part of how we're made. Now, before I continue in this section, you should know my wife has forbid me from making eye contact with her during this section. I told her, I said, I don't want to make eye contact with anybody. This is the perfect time to look at the balcony because I can't really see you. Um, but we have a great children's ministry and youth program that you'll probably put your kids in next week after this part of the sermon. Listen, focusing on your sexuality, I remember 15 years ago when Shannon and I uh, got married. Before that, we were, we were aiming towards, obviously, uh, not sleeping together before marriage. That was our goal, and we succeeded in that. But that meant that our honeymoon was going to be something that was really exciting. And I was shocked on our honeymoon in Aruba. I was shocked that we had time for things besides sex. I was just expecting that uh, that's just what you do. You're married. You'd have sex all day long. And so we had time to eat meals. We went on hikes. We rented a jet ski. That's not sex. It was a jet ski. We went off-roading. It was great. We did all these other things. I was just, listen, this is a big part of marriage. And how do you focus on your sexuality with your spouse? Well, first, it's with your spouse exclusively. Exclusively. Listen to Proverbs chapter 5. It says, drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well, should your springs overflow in the streets? Should streams of water in public squares? Let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. Physical intimacy within marriage is described as, as, a, private, as a private well, as a private source of running water, that it would be the purest of all water not water that's just spreading out along the streets and sewers and then being collected, you know, through the gutters. Like, no, this is a private act that, that God has blessed the marriage with. He has walled off physical intimacy for marriage as his design, not to prevent us from joy, but to keep that joy safe. Right, it's just like fire, fire's great. I was a bit of a pyromaniac when I was a kid. My mom told our kids this, and so they're always telling me, you can't say that to us. You, you lit the dunes on fire in North Carolina. I said, yes, but that was 30 years ago. So, yeah. Or they say, oh, you, you were shooting fireballs in the back of the woods in New Jersey. The police never corroborated that. They never said that that actually happened. So I love fire, but listen, fire's meant for a campfire, it's meant for a fireplace in a house. It's not meant for the couch, all right? Fire on a couch will destroy the whole house. And the same thing is true for physical intimacy. God wants to bless it within the safety of a marriage union. And so we wanna have exclusivity with our spouse in this, especially with, with our eyes. We should be exclusive. Job said this in Job 31. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. Job is advanced in his years. He's been married for a long time. And yet he says, beauty is defined by my spouse alone. That is what beautiful is. I'm not gonna look at the young maidens. That's not for my eyes to see. He just focused on his wife. We should have exclusivity in our thoughts. Jesus said in Matthew chapter five, I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Right? We, we want to be so pure in our relationship with our spouse that, that even our thoughts are right. Praise God if you never cross that physical line of adultery, adultery, right? But you want to make sure you're not crossing that in your own mind and you're repenting of that. When you're making the vow with your spouse on the wedding day, it includes all of that. Eyes, mind, you, you don't say, yeah, I'm never going to you know, sin against you in this way, but in my mind, I'm going to think all these dirty thoughts. No, no one would say that. And yet God wants to purify us even in a place that nobody else knows what is going on. And he can. And exclusivity with our actions. 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, flee from sexual immorality. Just, just run from it. Just get out of there. Get away from that temptation so you don't cross that line. God has blessed this within the walls of the marriage union. And outside of that, it causes chaos and destruction although it is advertised as something that is only pure joy with no consequences, but we all know that's not true. And so one of the most important 
and life-changing things that we can talk about today, if you'll trust me on this, this is absolutely life-changing, is that we have to deal with the sin issue of pornography. The statistics are terrifying at what young ages kids are looking at pornography for the first time and how many people are viewing pornography into all their adult years. It is ruining us, it is eroding our souls, it's making us shallow and it's hollowing us out and it's causing much more damage than we think this private act really is causing. And so I'd like to ask every single man at Cornerstone to do something, which is to, to read this book with me. There's a fantastic book called The Death of Porn, Men of Integrity Building a World of Nobility. It's by Ray Ortland. He's an amazing gospel preacher And this is such a good gospel book that can bring about freedom. And so, so wives, uh, I'm asking your husbands to buy this. And so you don't have to say, oh, no, there's an alarm going off. Oh, no, there's a problem. This is a great book to read, even if you're walking in victory when it comes to lust issues. And again, it can prevent them, and it can give victory for those that are in bondage to this. And so text the word book to that number, or just go ahead and buy it on Amazon on May 26. We're going to get together and have a discussion about what we read, and then we're going to pray for each other that God would give us the strength to walk rightly, even with our eyes and our minds. And so you want to have exclusivity with your spouse only, but also... We can focus on our sexuality by by thinking about the blessing that physical intimacy brings. Proverbs 5 goes on to say, may your fountain be blessed and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. There's a blessing that can come from doing things God's way. For some, marriage will lead to the blessing of children. This 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 should really rattle our minds. I mean, think about this. This is the only act When you think about how shallow the world says it's not not a big deal, it's nonchalant, it's just a thing, it's just a little hookup, it's just a little one-night stand, here's what can happen with sex in marriage, or sex at all. A human soul that previously did not exist can come into being that is immortal that will spend its life either in eternity in heaven or eternity in hell. Sex does that, and the world just says it's casual, it's not a big deal, have sex with anyone you want, a soul is created that we can't even guarantee gets to heaven. Listen, we're being lied to that sex is casual. It's not just for pleasure. It's sex for a meaning, for a purpose. Children are sometimes that purpose. A more stable family is that purpose. Whether you have kids or not, this unifies husband and wife, that they only find this joy in the marriage, makes them one and unifies. It brings great pleasure, strength over temptation, and brings about the oneness that we see in the scriptures. And so think about these blessings. You don't want to throw all that away. And then finally, improve your satisfaction in sex. Proverbs 5 goes on to say, a loving doe, a graceful deer. I think it's just trying to get us to think about a cute animal for a second because we're all feeling uncomfortable. But then it goes in for the kill. It says, may her breasts satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. Sadly, sometimes in marriage, Sex is just a way for someone to fulfill their own lust rather than there to be this oneness and this joint joy together. And people can walk away from physical intimacy feeling used because of the motives behind it. So how do we make sure we're improving our intimacy in marriage? Well, by aiming to serve your spouse's needs. Saying it's not about me. I want to make this the best experience for my spouse that it possibly could be. And then if they're thinking the same thing, then you're going to be improving this by communicating in a loving way your, your desires for sex. Now, there's nothing more uncomfortable on the planet than having this conversation with your spouse. And it requires a lot of nerve, and it, it may take years for you to work up the boldness, but, but you're allowed to have these conversations. Hebrews 13.4 says the marriage bed is pure. And so if you have a conversation with your spouse saying, you know, hey, um, you know, may, maybe... Sometime uh, we could try, and she's like, "Well, just just spit it out. What are you What are you saying? You're making me nervous." You're like, "Breakfast for dinner. Uh, breakfast for dinner. Maybe sometime we could try that. That'd be great." And you you wimped out and you couldn't say it. You're like, "Maybe sometime we could." Listen, you just talk about this. The marriage bed is undefiled. Here's what the scripture says about the satisfaction that can happen in sex. Song of Solomon, chapter seven, verse ten says. 
I belong to my beloved, and his desire is for me. Come, my beloved, and let us go to the countryside. Let us spend the night in the villages. Let us go early to the vineyards and see if the vines have budded, if their blossoms have opened, and if the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. The mandrakes send out their fragrance, and at our door is every delicacy, both new and old, that I have stored up for you, my beloved. She, she's talking about a romantic getaway, another honeymoon, and she's talking about sexual satisfaction as fruit that she has prepared for her husband. Listen, within marriage, long-term marriage, there can be this deepening of intimacy that can just get better and better. And finally, we wanna love our spouse by focusing on our spirituality, our spirit. Right? We have a spirit element to us, and we want to focus on that. But this is the most neglected part of intimacy. We're told in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists, first of all, and that he rewards those who seek him. And so any time that we make an effort to, to seek God, we're believing that he's real and that he's so good, he'll reward that effort. But we do that together. We say, I want to invest in my marriage spiritually so we're seeking God and receiving those rewards together. Having a spirit distinguishes humans from animals. The fact that God gave us a spirit so we can commune with God makes us different than the animals. When we neglect this, we act like the animals and our decisions are all just primal in, in nature and instead of thoughtful and spiritual. You never see on TikTok a little cat, you know, meow, 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 worshiping the Lord. You're like, oh, that cat is just worshiping Jesus. Listen, you just don't see that. That is a human thing to worship the Lord. And so it's so important because divorce rates for first marriages are like 40%, and for second marriages, I think it's like 60%. So we've got to do something to address this. What can we do? Well, with Jesus, you can bring those horrible chances of divorce down to next to nothing. And the first thing that you can do that does this is to schedule a daily time of prayer. If you have a daily time of prayer, it is game changing, especially if you can separate it from the meal time and just have it be a separate time where just husband and wife are praying together. It's powerful. There was a 1997 Gallup poll that said couples that pray together daily only have a chance of one in 1,152 to divorce. The percentage dropped from that 40% number down to less than 1%. That was a defining characteristic of couples that stayed married. It was that they prayed together daily. And every decade or so, the stat is updated and really reveals the same thing. In 2011, there was a book written called Couples Who Pray, The Most Intimate Act We Can Do Together. And in, and in this book, Researchers found the strongest predictor of relationship satisfaction was shared prayer, but it improves every area of marriage. How much we pray, if we just pray sometimes, great, it's better than never, but if we pray a lot, everything changes in our marriage. I mean, happiness goes from 60% to 78%. I mean, knowing that your spouse delights in you goes up 30%. You just convinced that your spouse loves you and delights in you. And then check this out. That my spouse is a skillful lover goes up like 18% or 17%. Whoever would have guessed, you know, you're asking for advice. Oh, I wonder how I can do better in this category. Here's the deal. Pray with your spouse every day. That's the creepiest voice I could do. I don't know why. It didn't even have to be creepy, but that's the accent I chose. Last service, it was, last service, it was like a southern man the ex, I, next service will be a Russian. I don't know. Listen, but listen, you want to improve when it comes to romance and improve in the bed? Praying? Pr because, because it's based on intimacy. It draws you closer together. It reminds you that you're safe and secure in God's boundary of marriage and things change for the better. And yet, most surveys say only 10, 11% of couples pray together daily. It changes everything. It practically can't say this perfectly, but it practically divorce proofs your marriage, and none of us are doing it, right? And yet, it can change everything. If we would just listen, Colossians 4.2 says, devote yourself to prayer. Not just, yeah, I pray once in a while. No, devote yourself to prayer. So how do you pray with your spouse in a way that is meaningful? 
Well, I discovered a really cool acronym that I want to share with you that is specific for the marriage relationship. Couples can use this model. It's called the RINGS Prayer Chat Model. And that acronym just stands for real, intentions, needs, grateful, and, and someday. And so you could start out by being real with God and say, Father, right now I'm feeling you know, sad or distracted or, or hurt. And here's the amazing thing when you're praying with a couple is that you're expressing how you feel to God and your spouse gets to hear how you're feeling. And then your spouse shares how they're feeling. This, this draws you closer together and closer to the Lord. Intentions. God, reveal your priorities for us today. It reminds you that you're on a mission, that God is real. It's not about your happiness. It's, it's, a, it's about what God wants to do with your marriage, what he's doing. Needs, the daily bread we need from you today is this. Grateful, I'm so thankful that you've done this in our lives. And then someday I'd, I would like to enjoy this. We, we would really love for this to happen one day. Oh Lord, we'd love to buy a home one day. And you're sharing your dreams and your desires. These categories are so diverse, it really will draw a husband and wife closer together as they're seeking the Lord for help. I think it's a great thing to try. So schedule daily prayer, but also attend church together. Attend church together. In 2016, there was a report where, where couples said they were either very happy or extremely happy based on whether or not they attended church. If both of them attended, 78% of couples were very or extremely happy with their marriage. And check this out. If only the man attended the church and, and the wife stayed at home, 78% of those couples still said they were very or extremely happy. The sad thing is, if only the woman was attending, that number drops down to 59% of couples that were very or extremely happy. And so that's obviously discouraging. I want to tell those, those women that are here without their husbands, don't give up. It's important. You're still increasing the odds in your marriage from, from not attending at all. But men, get to church. Go with your spouse to church and watch it change your relationship. And finally, just in general, invest in your marriage spiritually Right, be, be a leader in your home and say, I wanna invest in this marriage spiritually. We wanna, we wanna help you do that. So we've created a marriage resource page. If you text the word marriage or just go to our website and, and click on this link, we have gathered our, our favorite books on marriage, podcasts for the car you can listen to, right now media videos that you can watch together. There's even Instagram accounts so that instead of just seeing what your friends are up to or what sports are doing, all of a sudden a marriage strengthening idea pops up on your Instagram. We have couples life groups. We have local marriage retreats, some of them for marriages that are on the rocks, right? Marriages that are, that are giving up hope. There's three of them within an hour's driving distance of here that happen multiple times a year that are designed to give a marriage a reboot. We have local LMFT counselors that you can uh, sign up to be with, request prayer. There's so many things. This is a good page to look at and say, let me just pick one of these things to invest in my marriage spiritually, or let me pick one of these things from each of the categories and just take a different time during the year to focus on them. We need to do this. The Word of God in the Bible is described as nourishment for our souls. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, the, the Word is described as bread or manna from heaven. And so as we're partaking of the Word, our spiritual diet, we will grow, but you wanna do that together. It can't just be, I'm gonna leave my spouse in the dust as I pursue the Lord, and I have no time for my spouse, I'm just gonna get into 10, 10 life groups. No, it would be better to say, let's get into a couple's life group together. All right, let's do this together so that we can grow at the same pace. If one of you is eating more spiritual food than the other, it's not gonna be at the same pace. In our house, um, I, I've read some stats that, uh, Eggs at a young age can really help height, and height's really important to our family. No offense out there, but listen. And so Titus, whenever I say, hey, who wants eggs? Titus is like, eggs, give me only eggs. And he devours them. And Gideon and Abigail are like, I don't want eggs, I want cereal. I'm like, of course you do, it's sugar in a box. And so, but I'm always making them eat eggs, but then Titus will eat all the leftovers. And so this guy's gonna be a beast. He's going to surpass all of them. He's growing at a faster rate, not at the same rate, because they're not eating the same food. I know there's other reasons why people grow and don't grow, but listen, spiritually, let's invest in each other and seek the Lord spiritually together and see what the Lord might do. All of this is to say, invite Jesus into your marriage, whether you need to start with repentance or whether you just wanna say, we're done with these distractions, we're seeking the Lord 
We're making this a season where our marriage is growing together more closely. Let's do that. And we have an opportunity coming up at Cornerstone on, on June 24th. Um, it's a marriage comedy event here at the church. 7 p.m., so just enough time to get those men back from, from fishing in San Diego. If there's no traffic, they'll get back just in time. It'll be great. And you listen, you text the word comedy and sign up. It's, a, it's called Funny How Marriage Works by Michael Jr. He's a re- you can see him on Instagram, really funny guy. He, he does this, this kind of comedy sketch uh, with, his, with his wife that is hilarious, but then he, he brings biblical principles to build you up in those moments. There's a cornerstone only 20% off discount if you use the discount code LAUGH by May 7th and you get a discount because we're hosting this community event here at our church. We think it'll be a great date night for married couples here in the church. And so however God's calling you to invest in your marriage, be faithful, be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. So Father, help us. Lord, we know how special marriage is and, and what you've made it to be We need to set it up in our minds as holy, as set apart, as as different from our other relationships and invest in it and pour into it because it is precious and is full of meaning and can be a great blessing to each other, to our families and to our communities if we make this our focus, Lord. So give us the strength to do that and give us great joy and restore and reconcile any marriages that are broken and on the rocks and and struggling, Lord. Pray that you would give them hope that it's not over and that you can still do a miracle. So we commit this to you in Jesus' name, amen. Hope that you can come back next week as we finish off this series. God bless you and have a great day.